Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, those words when we hear them in Luke's gospel are rather shocking, aren't they? Luke tells us that people were coming to be baptized by John, and it simply says, Jesus was baptized too. Don't you have to ask yourself the question, how can that be? How can it be that the, the sinless Son of God subjected himself to the very tool, the means by which God cleanses sinners of their sins and makes them children of God? How can it be when at his baptism the skies opened up and the Father spoke from the clouds and said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. How is it then that Jesus is baptized, that very thing that makes you and I acceptable to God, when Jesus was in fact already acceptable to God? After all, he's the one about whom we sing in the liturgy, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord all God, God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Those would be shocking words, indeed, if the assumption we were making is that Jesus was baptized for the same reasons that you and I are. But Jesus wasn't baptized to wash away sins. He was baptized in order to signal a, the beginning of a ministry to wash away sins, your sins and mine. Jesus was not baptized in order to become acceptable to God. He was being baptized because he, in fact, already was the only acceptable substitute that could bring about the work of our redemption. Yes, his baptism was for reasons different from ours, and yet the blessings that come to us are unbelievable. If it wasn't for Jesus' baptism, our own baptism wouldn't mean anything. But now because Jesus was baptized and began a ministry of redemption, you and I are connected to what Jesus did for the entire world. Jesus did all those things for everyone, but our baptism connects us to Christ. And our baptism connects us to his work, and it really accomplishes three things. Our baptism reminds us that God is committed to us. Our baptism gives us a cleansing from sin, and our baptism, in fact, gives us confidence of heaven. You know, a lot of people, when they come for baptism, they think what they're doing is they're, they're giving their life to the Lord. They're choosing their Savior to be the Lord of their lives. And, or maybe if they're bringing a child to baptism, they have this idea that they're dedicating that child to the Lord. But, you know, baptism isn't about the commitment that we're making to him. Baptism is about God making a commitment to us. We're not making the promises. He is. And the promise that he makes to us is one of kindness and of love and of mercy. The very same kindness, love, and mercy that the Apostle Paul was talking about as he wrote in Titus. And when he says that God is kind, he's not talking about the kind of detached, hope everything goes well with you kind of kindness. Not this polite on the surface, I wish you no harm. Not that kind of kindness. But God's kindness means that he's interested in every detail, in every facet of our life. God wants to be intimately involved in our physical and our spiritual welfare. He wants to make sure that we're blessed in this earth and we're blessed all the way to eternity. He's kind to you. And not only is he kind to you, he loves you. And loves you with a, a love that you can't truly understand because you could never duplicate it. You could never replicate it. It's so often when we love people, we love because we think we have something to gain from it, right? I love my brother because he always has my back, no matter what. I love my friend 
because I know I'm going to be able to count on him when I need him the most. But God, God's love is different. God loves us like brothers, even though we treated him like an enemy. God loves us, even though we have absolutely no way whatsoever to help him, nor does he need it. God loves us simply because he chooses to love us. And he doesn't withhold that kindness and that love until we prove ourselves worthy. Did you hear what Paul said? He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. That word mercy is a, a one I want us to focus on for a little while too. What it really means is faithfulness. God's love drove him to be faithful. It drove him to be faithful to a promise he made going all the way back in the Garden of Eden when man fell into sin and brought ruin and corruption not only on the world but also on himself. When Adam and Eve destroyed their perfect communion with God, what did God say? I'm going to put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve. I'm going to put hostility and warfare between the two of you. You two conspired and worked together. You became friends here, but not in the future. You're going to be enemies, and one of Eve's offspring is going to come, and he's going to crush Satan's head forever. That was a promise that God made to his fallen people. And God demonstrates a faithfulness to that promise in the fact that he chooses to love us by sending the most unlikely redeemer of them all. God himself. God comes down to this world and takes on a frail human body, just like yours and mine. And he lives and he carries the weight of our sin all the way to the cross. God himself suffers the punishment that should have been ours. God himself stretches out his arms on a cross to pay for your sin and mine. God himself breathes his last breath and God himself dies. God himself lies in your grave. The grave that was meant for you. Jesus assumed that grave. Because God was being faithful to his promise, prompted by his love and by his mercy. Our baptism. Our baptism is the way that God connects us to what Jesus did for the world. It becomes personally ours when the water is poured from the pastor's hand upon the baptized forehead. What does God do? He says, this one's mine. I'm going to put my name on them. I'm going to claim them as my own. I'm going to brand them and mark them with the very cross that it took to make it all possible. He makes a commitment to us at the baptismal font. Not a one-time commitment that if, if you fall back into sin, well, then you're out of luck. You've missed out on the promise of God. No, it's a daily commitment. An ongoing commitment. And even though I fall into sin over and over again, I go back to what happened at that baptismal font, and I remind myself, I am baptized. Happened long ago, but the results continue on every single day of my life. That baptism reminds me that every single time I fall into sin, I'm washed again. That baptism every single day renews me in the promise of God of my forgiveness. That baptism empowers me to be more like the child of God that he always wanted me to be. You see, it wasn't just Adam and Eve. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that ruined this world and corrupted themselves and drove a wedge between them and God. It's all of us, every single one that came after them. We're not passive victims. We're participants in that rebellion. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the verses just before our text. If you go back and read them, 
This is what you'll see. We too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. The sad truth is what that means is just like Adam and Eve, we deserve to be banished from the presence of God. We deserve to be barred from heaven, and yet instead of God destroying us, God chooses to recreate us. Recreate us through baptism. That's what John is referring to in the first part of his gospel lesson. Remember the words? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's why we see Jesus in the Jordan River, not being baptized for his own sin, but so that through his perfect obedience, he could give us a new beginning, a new life and a new start, so that he could, in fact, recreate us and give us a new life that wouldn't end in death and damnation. What happened at the first Christmas was, in fact, the second Genesis. Did you get that? What happened at Christmas time was, in fact, a second Genesis. What did God say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light. John's gospel, in the beginning, was the word. And God said, let the light of the world be born. Jesus was the connection between the first Genesis and the second. He's the way by which God connects us to this new life, this new world. And that cleansing comes to us personally through baptism. It's more than just a washing away of our sin. It is, in fact, a washing of regeneration. Get that word, regeneration. What it means is Genesis again. A new Genesis. We're taken right back to the Garden of Eden when God puts man in the garden in a perfect world as a perfect man of God. He gives us a new Genesis through baptism. It's a washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You know what that word renewal means? It means restoration. It means renovation. We have been restored and renewed so that now in Christ we are brought into perfect peace and harmony with God just as it was before the first fall into sin. How can that be? How can that be, you ask? Because I know that I don't live in perfect harmony with God, not every single moment of not every single day. I know that just as I do today, also tomorrow, I will be at war with God. This perfect harmony will once again be destroyed. And I'm going to be on the outs with God. Through your baptism, you are renewed every day. Through the baptism, you have that regeneration every single time. You stain the righteous robe given to you by Jesus Christ. You are washed and cleansed anew. And what that means is, yes, you have a commitment from God. And because you have that commitment from God that results in cleansing, you can live in confidence. I always joke about the fact that because of my schedule, I can't watch a lot of sporting events live. I always have to record them. And I joke about the fact that it's really hard to watch those games after they've happened without somebody telling me how it ended. And I have to tell you, it's not anywhere near as much fun as when I don't know the score. But what's frustrating for watching sports isn't that confidence building when it comes to the contest between you and sin and Satan. You already know how it ends. You already know the outcome. How do we know? What does Paul say? Having been justified by his grace, we are heirs. 
having the hope of eternal life. Justified means God looks at us just as if we've never sinned. God, our judge, declares us not guilty. And look at the tense. Having been justified. It's already taken place. It's a done deal. The verdict has already been rendered. You are not guilty in Jesus Christ. And what that does is it makes you an heir. You know the end. And you know the inheritance. You have forgiveness. You have life. You have salvation. And no one and nothing can take it away from you. If you doubt it, pull out your baptismal certificate. And say, here's the proof. Here is the proof of the commitment of my God. Here is the proof of the cleansing that took place. Here is the proof that I can live every single day confident of my salvation. Think about it. Every time you step in the shower, as the day begins, I am washed again and renewed spiritually, just as I am here now physically, because of the blessings that come to you through baptism. None of that would have been possible if Jesus had not humbled himself to come down to this world. None of that would have been possible if Jesus had not begun a ministry that started out with his baptism in the Jordan River. But that baptism signaled the beginning of a ministry. A ministry of serving as our Savior, living for us and dying for us a ministry that triumphs over sin and death. Never forget that's who he is. He is your redeemer. His life is your life. His death paid for your death. And all because your baptism connects you to Christ.